Well, look, I've got to say, man, um, congrats with the film. I oh, uh, saw it last night and I absolutely loved it. Oh. Um, what I want to know is, um, where's the, where did visual inception come from if you wanted to go to Tumula to, to, to and actually make a film there? Well, Tumula is where my mother grew up and all of my Indigenous family come from there. And um, I guess I've always wanted to go back there and, and make a film, but it just took a long time to work out how, how to go about it. Yeah. Because I didn't want to go out there and um, you know, write a script and then take a heap of actors out there and take a crew out there. I just wanted to make it with the community. Um, but um, it just took a while for me to get the confidence to try and go out there and, and basically just go in there by myself and, and make the film um, entirely by myself and the community. Um, you mentioned your mum was from there, and I've read that you, you've visited the community a couple of times when you were a youngster. Yep. But what I want to know was, like, what was your initial reactions going back there as an adult? Um, I've always been going going back there. I went there, I went back to my on and off when, uh, during high school. I, I lived a couple of hours to the south of there. Um, and I, when I finished, you know, uh, finished high school, I went to university and, and studied photography. And during that time, I went back and took lots of photographs and um, at that time I, I reconnected with the place um, by myself through photography and um, since then I've been going back I guess maybe once once every year or something like that yes. but um, um, when I went out to make the film it was um, you know, I guess maybe half the people didn't know who I was even though I was related to them um, but within a few days, um, everyone knew that I was there to, to, to write a film and to make a film, and, and they were very, everyone was you know, they were really keen and enthusiastic about the whole idea of it. Yeah. Was it yours, always your intent to uh, use non-actors uh, for the roles, or was that something that came about when you uh, went up there and moved in there for a couple of months? Yeah, that was the biggest challenge, because I, I was writing a script, but um, in the back of my mind, I'm always a little bit worried, because I'm, I'm knowing that um, that, that this, all these words have to be said by these people who haven't acted before, and um, so that was always on my mind. And um, I didn't really, I didn't really have any plan to take actors in there, so I just wanted them to represent themselves. Um, and so that was the big challenge in making the film, trying to get um, all of these first-time actors to to pull off um, some performances. And um, I didn't really know how to do that until. Um, couple of days into filming, I kind of developed a technique where I, where I uh, decided to, to feed lines to the entire cast and, and not let them look at the script at all, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to try to read something, and so um, yeah, it was just me filming with one eye and looking at the script with the other eye and calling out lines, and so it was, it was a really complex thing to do, but I think it was the only way I could go in there and capture something that was authentic and, and truthful. Yeah. Well, you've got um, Dean Daly Hughes in the film. Um, I'm just trying to get the timeline right. What was the first film you were seeing? Was that Mad Buses? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, cause my producer, David Jowsey, he had made, um, he had produced uh, Mad Bastards, and um, he, he, he knew Dean through that, and um, um, the character that Dean plays in the film, um, he's, a, he's a big guy, and um, when I was initially casting for that role, there was no one in Tumala to, to, with that kind of physique because mm. they, they were all, I found out later, they were all locked up in jail themselves. Yeah. And so um, I had to go elsewhere just for that, that character and he's the only one I ended up bringing in, in, in um, from outside yeah. to make the film. Um, uh, the thing I noticed about him is that he's got such a um, magnetic screen presence. Um, uh, was that something you felt as well when you were filming? Yeah, Dean was a real dream for me, a real gift. Um, uh, He'd only made one film before, but he came um, knowing his lines. Yeah. And so that was you know, that was such a relief for me because I could just sit there and and and, do, and film the scene and not have to worry about calling out lines. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah, I, I was um, yeah I, I was just reminded about how how much easier it is when you've got someone who kind of knows what you're doing in the acting department. Yeah. Um, that type of. Uh, uh Filmmaking that you did with this film, is that something you think you will want to uh, uh, repeat again in our future films? Or is this like a one deal, uh, no, try it out? I, I think the one man, the one man band days are over for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did it with um, Dreamland, this film, um, the previous film, and also um, with this, but you know, I'll split the difference next time. Yeah. Next time. My next film is a, a, a genre film, and, 
and uh, it requires a bit of a crew. But in saying that, I, I still just want maybe 10, 13 mm-hmm. people yeah. at, the, at the daily crew, not, yeah. not go crazy, just keep it intimate still. Yeah. Well, speaking about the intimacy, um, I really felt there was a real intimacy in the details of, uh, of course, Tim, you're using real actors and such, but I'm talking more about the, the story and the script. Um, is there anything, any part of you that was in Daniel's story, as in how Daniel was some represented on the screen? Not really. I think I think I, I told a lot of my story in my first film, Beneath yeah. Clouds, and, and um, in Tumor, it's pretty much the story of Daniel and, and a lot of the people who live out in Tumor. It's not really my own personal experience of growing up. It's, uh, um, it, it's their experience, and um, I guess Tumalar is, is is my experience of their experience. Um, yeah, through through constantly observing them and then going away and putting it into a script. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you don't like to describe the film as an issues film, but there's certain things that I've, I've picked up on while watching them. Um, one of them is that there seems to be a sort of um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of an inbuilt nihilism to a lot of characters. Um, a lot of them have lost the culture of their ancestors, but then at the same time they kind of rejected the other type of um, uh, influences that came in the community as well. Do you think that type of um, uh, uh, loss of uh, spiritual guidance um, is something that really um, has created a dire, a dire thing in the community? Yeah, for me that's the number one issue, and I, and I, I call it cultural extinction, and it's something that I think governments don't really spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. Um, and it's, the more, it's a more difficult thing to approach. Um, it's easy to build houses, and and uh, you know, health and education can be um, can be um, improved um, largely to you know through building you know, schools and clinics and all that kind of thing. Um, but the psyche of, of the internal psyche of, of these kids is, is something that's a lot more complex. And, uh, and I think it's kind of the key to um, improving um, where they live and, and how they live. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, out there in Timula, they're living kind of in limbo. They they still have uh, echoes of the past and their past culture, um, but it's not enough to sustain a full system of living. Mm. And 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 they've only got bits and pieces of of, of mainstream Australia, um, mm. and so they're kind of in this limbo land, um, not one and not the other. Yeah. Um, and so um, I guess the film hints towards really um, reclaiming a sense of, the, of their own culture um, as a major part in moving forward. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a very prolific filmmaker. Like, this is your third feature film, so you've done short films, you have documentaries. Um, what type of criteria do you have in uh, selecting what project you're going to invest in? Um, it's I think it's just ever evolving. It's, it's it's changing. It just changes from each each. I guess each year, I, I, my brain changes, and I'm and I'm um, attracted to different things. And um, I guess Dreamland was like a sci-fi kind of. Yeah, that's the one with thing. the guys come out there looking for the angel photos. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and. Um, and the next film is a murder mystery, which is about an Aboriginal detective who has to solve the murders of yep. these young girls who are found out under the highway. And, and, and it's also uh, has a big kind of um, Western kind of influence as well. Yep. Um, uh, I guess that uh, step towards uh, a wider audience is where I'm kind of heading yep. gradually. And, um, and uh, the next film, which is called Mystery Road, that's... that's and, uh, the stepping stone to where I'm kind of aiming in the next five or six years. And how far along are you on that film? I was shooting that in April. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, can you talk about casting? Um, we've got. We were actually negotiating some big A class, um, A class uh, uh, Australian stars, cool. and um, and Aaron Pedersen is going to play the main um, role as a detective. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's, that sounds really cool. I look forward to checking that one. Comes out. Um, so. Of, of late, there's been like a real kind of um, emergence of indigenous filmmaking. Um, you have uh, Brand New Day to Samson's Empire, Mad Bastards, and you have this film. Uh, what do you t- uh, make of the whole indigenous kind of almost like a new wave of indigenous filmmaking? Okay. Well, it's just a matter of time because the Australian Film Commission invested a lot into um, film indigenous filmmakers in the early 90s, and, um, and they're still doing it now. And uh, I guess it's just the last few years you've, you've seen the results of that coming out because a lot of the filmmakers 
who are um, making features now, they've, um, they all started back in the 90s making short films through mm. the SBS Independent um, and, and the Indigenous branch um, of the Australian Film Commission, which is now Screen Australia. Um, and I guess you'll just get, be getting more and more in the, in, the, in the future. And I think the diversity of the films will, will grow because the number of films will grow. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's been a, a long time coming for this film. You had a uh, premiere back in May in Cannes Film Festival. We played at the Sydney Film Festival in June. You had a yeah, bunch of other film festivals in between. Now you get the release next week. What's the uh, feeling like now that the uh, the broader or Australian audience are going to check out this movie next Thursday? Well, the, 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 the previous screens we've had so far have been um, um, pretty positive and um, it's just been amazing to watch the... The, the uh, Two Mile Community screening was held last last week, yeah. and um, that was the first time they had seen it, seen themselves on the screen, and it was uh, an extraordinary experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, all these families just came together. Yeah. But yeah, I am, I am, it's, a, it's a culturally kind of specific uh, subject matter, and, and I think uh, it just depends a lot on your own perception and your own experience to how much you get out of the film and what you get out of the film. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time today, and congrats to the movie. Thanks. Cheers.